All right, should be live now. All right, thank you very much. I will call this meeting to order for the Salem Parks and Recreation Advisory Board meeting of May 13th, 2021. I'm the chair, Dylan McDowell, and we'll move right into roll call. Mickey Varney? Here. Alan Alexander? Okay, no Alan yet. Tony Cato? Woody Dukes? Here. Dave Frydenmaker? Here. Rick Hartwig? Here. Keith Norris? Here. Paul Rice? Present. Good to see you, Paul. I didn't see you sneak in at the end there. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, wonderful. As we get started tonight, I just want to make a quick note on the agenda. As many of you saw, there was a, there was a motion um, approved by City Council this week on Monday about uh, having SPRAB look into um, recommendations for policies for permitting at city parks. So we will be bringing that up under new business at the end tonight. And we have Mark Weinstein from the um, city attorney's office to talk with us as well, and Robert Chandler. So we will be getting into that a little bit later if there's any questions. Um, so we are gonna go through the rest of our agenda first. Um, and I'll also note that Councilor Nordyke might be joining us at some point to share a little bit more insight into that. Um, are there any questions or comments about the agenda beyond that? Okay, hearing none, just wanted to make that clarification. Um, and just to start off the meeting as well, I wanna say it was a pleasure to see many of you in person this last week. Uh, I know many of us got to be on that river, on the birding tour with the ranger. So thank you, Jen, for helping coordinate that. And please pass along the thanks to the ranger. It was really fun to have several of us out there and to be face to face for the first time. Uh, for many of you, it was the first time I was able to meet you in person. And Mickey, I hope the second day was just as successful. It was, we had a great time. <laughs> more, more intimate tour because there's only the two of us <laughs> well hopefully you didn't spend 30 minutes behind the train of yours so <laughs> nope <laughs> that was an experience in and of itself but hopefully we can get back uh, to some more of those events maybe a parks tour this summer if safety allows and some other outings like that so we can see one another in person and and have those opportunities so thank you again, Jennifer, for making that connection and Tony for helping coordinate that as well. And Patricia. All right, well, let's move into our minutes and approve those from the last meeting. I hope that everyone's had a chance to review them. Are there any comments or edits to the minutes from last time? We covered a lot of ground at our last meeting. I was impressed going back through the minutes. There was quite a bit that we covered. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes? I move that we approve the minutes from April 8th. Do we have a second? Yeah. All right. We can do a voice vote for the minutes. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. All right, hearing none, the motion cast, it passes and the minutes are approved. Let's move into our public comment. Um, there was a late addition to public comment from Councillor Nordyke, some written comment that was emailed out shortly before the meeting. As I mentioned, uh, she will hopefully join us to share some of this, but if you have not had a chance, I encourage you to pull that up in your inbox. Thank you, Tony, for sharing that. And as far as I'm aware, we do not have any other public comment signed up. Is that correct, Tony? Oh, you're on mute, sorry. I have received no uh, emails or you know, indications of public comment. Okay, wonderful. Um, then we will move right into our board items and presentations. And we're hearing from Jennifer and Patricia about the parks operation and planning budget. Tony's going to pull up the uh, PowerPoint presentation. And Jennifer, you're on first. Jennifer, you're on mute right now. So oh. are you, Tony? <laughs> Jen, <laughs> Jen I, um, I didn't move those slides, but what I can do is I'll just scoot over to, to rec when you, when, uh, you start on the rec portion. 
of the program. No, let's just go in the order the slides are. That's fine. Okay. Sorry, my that thing said the host wasn't allowing me to unmute, so I kept trying to talk and I was it wouldn't take me off mute. So sorry. Sorry, sorry, I didn't catch you quick enough. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Um, so um, as Dylan mentioned, we wanted to just go over um, relatively quickly the adopted parks operations, parks planning, and recreation services budgets um, for the upcoming 21-22 uh, fiscal year. So I cannot see the slides that Tony has up. Um, okay. It's not showing. It's not showing me them. So I'm not sure. Is anyone seeing the uh, presentation they're slide? They're not up. They're not up yet. Mm -hmm. Mitch, while that's happening, I see Alan Alexander just joined us. If you could make him a co-host, please. Is it up now? Can you see? It, it? is. Thanks, okay, Tony. Right. Alrighty. And you're seeing the main slide, right? Not the. Yes. The, okay. Okay, great. So, yeah. So if you want to, if you wouldn't mind, Tony, slip into the next slide, please. Okay. Um, so the current general fund situation um, uh, has not improved over uh, the last previous fiscal year. So as I'm sure a lot of you know, if not all of you know, that the general fund contains operations funding for fire, police, library, parks, recreation, center 50 plus, legal, municipal court, human resources, finance, facilities, um, information technology, and the mayor and city manager's office. Um, so it's quite a wide and diversified gambit um, that all are supported through the general fund monies that are received. So general fund is, um, as we've spoken about previously, is where the majority of our parks operations and rec recreation services funding resides. Um, so despite an increase in revenues uh, under typical years, as the economy continues to recover, the general fund is still experiencing slower growth in the revenue compared to the growth that we have in our expenditures to maintain and develop the parks. So the city has continues to be faced with increases in PERS costs, healthcare costs, and inflationary increases in the wages and materials and services. And all of those are factors in that escalated expenditure uh, uh, growth. So the next slide, so some, some of the parks operations highlights um, that were in the are in the adopted 21-22 budget is we have converted some of our seasonal hours and budgeted dollars into a career parks maintenance operator position. We were allowed to do only one position. Um, we, we certainly have a greater need than that. Um, as I think I've mentioned in previous meetings, parks operations the last, even the year prior to, to the COVID year, has had extreme difficulty in getting uh, continuity with seasonal staff um, to help support our, our parks maintenance. Um, certainly last year, uh, uh, well, and into this fiscal year with COVID, as we've dealt with that, it has been next to impossible um, to hire seasonal staff. There's a shortage of, st of, of staffing um, all, all around, not just for, for parks department, but the other city of Salem departments and, and Oregon as a whole. So um, uh, in the budget, obviously, to support the conversion of that uh, uh, to that parks maintenance operator career position, the seasonal labor expenditures um, were de de decreased to offset that expense. Um, additionally, I've mentioned in previous informational reports that the state um, D Department of Corrections Adult and Custody Labor Crews with the closure of Mill Creek, um, we no longer have the support. That was four crews that we lost. Um, so we currently only have one full-time Marion County crew who we utilized previously in, in addition to the four DOC crews. And then we have a part-time Marion County correctional crew that basically at this point just works on Fridays and Saturdays. So one and a half is a little bit of an overstatement, but you know, approximately that. Um, we're hoping, um, we've been in com uh, conversation with Marion County and we're hoping that they will have a second full-time crew available um, at the beginning of the next fiscal year when they, when they conclude meeting some obligations that they have with another entity for this fiscal year. 
We continue to emphasize uh, addressing deferred maintenance um, in, in our existing parks. Um, you know, we continue with an emphasis on uh, complete replacement or uh, individual pieces, uh, focuses on playground uh, equipment maintenance and um, um, tennis courts or, or multi-sports courts. We try to, to do some of those at least each year to help to, uh, uh, offset some of that deferred maintenance uh, that has uh, over the years continued to grow and escalate um, at a faster pace than, than our budget allows to, to support and address each year. Um, for capital items in this year's budget, we are getting a second vacuum hopper leaf collection system uh, to help us during um, the, the leaf pickup period um, and a, a grandstand mower, which for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a, it's a mower in which you stand actually on the back of that. It's a, a smaller type mower that helps you get into um, a little tighter uh, turns and, and has a little shorter radius. So uh, predominantly that will be for at Bush Park uh, with all of the trees there and stuff. Um, it's hard to use in a lot of the areas, a, a, a larger, wider mower. Um, so moving on into the graph, you can see in the, in the pie chart um, that 53%, as I mentioned earlier, of our, our parks um, revenue is general fund um, derived. Uh, the second highest is the state highway funds. State highway funds support um, the city tree efforts, work that's done on city trees. Um, and works that's work that is done in the right of ways. Um, and then we do receive some transient occupancy tax money, TOT money as it's, as it's referred um, uh, as well. Uh, specifically that revenue is derived from rental activity uh, uh, in Wallace Marine Park and Riverfront Park and Pringle Hall. So in total, $7,736,542 is, uh, is uh, what that accounts for in, in the budget for 21-22. Um, on the expenditure side, as I mentioned, um, you'll see the, the difference between 2021, this current fiscal year, and 21-22. The upcoming fiscal year, you'll notice the addition of that one conversion from seasonal to full-time PMO status, um, an increase of budget in personal personnel services of 6.2%. You'll see again reference um, that decrease in seasonal dollars again to, to, support, to support that conversion. In materials and services, uh, a 9% increase and that's really mostly due to inflation factors. Um, uh, and that would also include, you know, increase in costs for refuse services, um, electrical services um, and, and those types of utilities. Um, capital outlay for the two pieces of equipment that I referenced, um, that's uh, $51,000 um, of our budget to support uh, the purchase of those two pieces of, of equipment. And then you'll notice the transfer of the $50,000 that goes back to, as I just mentioned, for deferred maintenance. Um, we try to at least put some money um, aside um, and we put $50,000 the last few years um, uh, aside to, to deal with playground issues. Um, so some of the parks operation construction projects that will, that will be started, um, some riverfront electrical improvements, um, that's 280,000 is the budget for that. Uh, some of that money is coupled between either the trust and agency um, account for Riverfront and Parks SDCs. Um, the full playground equipment replacement at Wallace Marine Park, and that's the playground um, that is adjacent to the soccer fields at Wallace. Uh, that's a $250,000 budget, and that money is from uh, that has been saved from the transient occupancy tax. Um, Reese Hill. Park, which is in Southeast Salem. That is a complete playground equipment uh, replacement. Um, the equipment is in such a state that we need to, uh, from a safety standpoint, need to remove it and, and totally replace it. That's $159,000 budget. That is 
solely from parks operations general fund. So that is money that we've coupled this, as I mentioned, the $50,000 transfers I just referenced. So it's money coupled over the last few years in order to get us enough to be able to do that full replacement. Um, the Woodman Sea Park um, tennis court replacement, um, that's uh, the budget for that is $780,000. That money um, is really coming in from a variety of different funding streams. So some through trust and agency um, from a Woodmancy Trust and Agency account, ASR money from the project that's currently being done at Woodmancy Park, and then um, some of the difference through Parks SDCs. And then of course, as you're all familiar with, uh, the Salem Parks Improvement Fund or SPIF, as we call them, those projects, uh, $60,000 that we've been getting the last several years um, from the general fund to support kind of those small projects in parks that are initiated through neighborhood associations um, and, and work with park operations on, on kind of addressing some of those small project needs. So with that, I will turn it over to Patricia to talk about the uh, on the planning side. Thank you, Jen. Uh, mm -hmm. So, as you know, this last year, we completed several master plans. Um, we did Woodman Sea Gear and Bush Deepwood Cultural Landscape Management Plan. So this year we are scaling back a little bit on the master plans. Uh, we have Bailey Ridge, which we, we were supposed to do last year, but Woodman Sea um, bumped it out of the queue. So we're gonna be focusing on Bailey Ridge, um, which is down in the Illahi area. Um, and that will be happening starting next fiscal year. And then once the uh, our Salem comprehensive plan is adopted, there's gonna be several other uh, supporting documents such as the comprehensive park system master plan will need to be updated. Um, and so we're not quite sure when that will start. Um, we'll wait until and see what happens with our Salem project, but that will be one of the, the repercussions of that is to um, update that plan. And we've been keeping a running tally of various things that we wanna change and update in that plan. And then one of the more, um, the newer ideas that's been broached to us is for developers who are uh, have a subdivision, for instance, and a park within that, um, there's been some interest shown in the developer actually doing the park as part of their development. Um, and so if that's the case, sometimes that might speed up um, the need to have a master plan done in order to take advantage, take advantage of that construction opportunity. So we're just kind of keeping that, um, waiting to see what happens with some of those, those park ideas. Okay, next, Tony. So this next fiscal year, we're really gonna be focusing a lot on um, getting ready for some construction. Uh, so this includes preliminary studies based on previous master plans. So for instance, Battle Creek Park, um, Fairview Park, Gear Park is going up for adoption uh, to council, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of the month, end of May. Um, and then D Street or sometimes called North Campus. Um, there's some street improvements that are happening along there that are more related to transportation, but that do border the park. So there's some sidewalks that are gonna go in. Um, and then some of the other parks such as um, Bill Regal. So we went for a grant for Bill Regal um, through o OPRD. And unfortunately we did not get that grant. Um, their funding has been severely hampered by COVID um, because they get a lot of their money, a lot of their revenue um, from the lottery system. And so of course their, that lottery system was um, impacted by COVID. And so there was a fewer projects that were funded uh, so what we did is we had actually set aside enough money to, to construct it. Um, and so we just decided we're going to go ahead and construct it ourselves because we really would like to complete that park. It's in a very high need area of Salem. Um, and we've already done phase one. And so this would be a phase two. So we'll be adding some other amenities for different age groups. And, and then that park would be completed, which would be great. Um, the other thing is Eagles View. We finished the master plan. And so now we're looking at some preliminary studies to look at uh, possibly a pedestrian bridge to get across a little drainage. Um, same with Battle Creek, looking at maybe a bridge to, to connect the, the two sides across Battle Creek. And then Fairview um, also is looking at some options for a phase one development. There's a new road, Lindbergh Road, that's been constructed. So we're kind of reassessing 
if that changes our, our phase one um, options by having that new road in. And then Gear Park, um, as I mentioned, is going up for adoption, but there's money set aside to start looking at some preliminary designs for um, some initial work possibly for a skate park. All right, next slide. And this just shows you the breakdown of the different projects. Um, our funding comes from Parks SDCs. The only other funding that's shown there for Fairview is from um, design DDAs. What does that stand for? Um, design, no, developer designated. Robert, help me out if you remember. Um, oh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm at the beach yeah, now. <laughs> Stands for Development District Fee. Development, thank you. Development District DDFs. Okay, yeah. so and it's essentially um, like an SDC, but it's set in a special district for it. Okay, that's it. So that that applies in the Fairview District. And what are SDCs? If I system development charges. So all development developers pay a fee towards parks. Um, Tony, we lost the presentation. Last I saw, I was in Tahiti. <laughs> Not a bad place to end up. <laughs> but Patricia, if I could just also real quick, while we while we have a lull, uh, <laughs> you were showing phase one, phase two. Uh, how are the different phases de defined? Uh, so sometimes phase, like for instance, at Gear, phase one has already been done. There's existing ball fields and parking lots, but there's a big chunk of the property that is still undeveloped. So that, so now we're looking at phase two to kind of complete that park. And so and is then, that just kind of uh, an, an, an internal indication or is that part of the master plan uh, process or is it, um, I guess. So usually, you know, so when we do a master plan, we look at the whole park, but then because of our funding, um, we, ha we have to break it down into smaller pieces. So we start looking then at like, what are some kind of logical pieces to construct um, together or that was really high demand that we, we learned about through the public engagement process. Um, so it's kind of looking at logistics and, um, and what the features are that make logical sense for a phase one. Okay, so phase one, so it's, it's pretty park dependent. There's not a- yes. Phase one isn't always just basic trails or anything. It's kind of park dependent based on the, the feedback from the community during the master planning process and what the whole overall thing looks like. Correct. Yeah. Okay. I mean, a lot Thank of times you. we do what we call interim use, which might just be some soft trail trails and a mutt right. or something like that. That's just kind of, that's like really pre-development almost. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Trisha, a quick question on the SDCs um, being under the fund source. Where does that go exactly under the pie chart that Jen showed earlier in terms of income to the parks department? Or is that a separate, is that different from the pie chart and that only goes directly to mm -hmm. capital costs like this? Yes, it, parks SDCs cannot be used for maintenance. Um, oh. And so they're in a separate pot. Understood, thank you. So I, I didn't do a pie chart. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Patricia, I think, dare I Patricia. Say Oh, did you get yes. the answer to your question? Isn't it a development district, the other funding source? Yeah, yeah, we got the answer. To oh, okay, okay. Okay. Tricia, do you know offhand the balance in the STC account? Oh, I do not. I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the end of, um, end of April accounting, so I don't have that in hand. Okay. Okay, so picking back up, um, we're gonna swing back to uh, now to recreation services. So um, our plan and what's demonstrated in our budget is to sustain existing youth recreation programs, the summer parks, the sports camps, all come tract and field meets and, and cross uh, and country kids relays, um, our stride events, uh, those being five and 10,000 meter uh, runs, um, our softball program, which includes tournaments and league play, um, and, and the incorporation of kickball, which we incorporated probably three or four years ago. Um, and then as well, the coordination and support for community events. So on the revenue side for recreation services, similar to parks operations, the preponderance of the money 
that is derived is general fund. Um, the percentage is a little higher in recreation services. It's 65% of their budget uh, that, that of revenue is, is general fund. Um, they do receive a small portion of TOT funds, um, some for community um, uh, events and some through softball. Um, it's only 7%, seven so it's a nominal amount. Um, the rest is really from direct fees um, and, and permits and uh, revenue from support of their program. So those registering for play for softball um, or kickball, the league play um, for Melinda's sports camps um, and, and her programming, her youth programming. So it's, it's uh, the preponderance 28% is, is through that direct revenue stream from, from the programs that are offered. You can go forward a couple slides, please, Tony. Yeah. Um, so the breakdown for recreation services um, is uh, it's, it, we're sustaining and keeping a status quo, the four positions, that being uh, Becky, who supports the community events, Melinda, who does the youth programming, and uh, Billy and Lindsay, who do softball and, and kickball support. Um, personnel services, uh, an increase of 8.3%. And that really is um, just um, uh, kind of inflationary factors um, uh, that we do for, uh, that are labor related expenses. It's not for, you know, normal colas and, and, and uh, wage increases, things of that nature. Uh, materials and services, uh, 3%, and that's really, um, again, just kind of an inflationary increase for the cost of supplies to support those events. Um, so in total, the budget for recreation services is uh, 1.3, almost $1.4 million. And... We already did that. You can skip. I think we already kind of covered that, Tony. Um, so really to, to summarize um, kind of the issues, the challenges that we see in 2021, the continuing challenges are really um, capital versus the operating funds um, to kind of get some level of balance in that. Um, the opportunities ahead of resources is a challenge for us. Um, you know, there's always... Um, the need um, and the desire to purchase additional land um, for future parks. Um, but when, you know, obviously the, the other side of that is when it's developed, um, then we have to have folks to maintain that. And so trying to keep the balance and, and being able to support the development um, of new parks. Um, and then we continue to address a long list um, and, a, and a growing list of deferred maintenance needs um, in our in our park system. And we continue, we've been doing this for the last several years, we continue to look for opportunities for efficiency um, to make up for uh, the lack of staff. Um, you know, one of the things I mentioned earlier on one of the capital outlay purchases uh, was the leaf hopper, um, the second one we're purchasing. That's something um, that we can run and cuts down about one fifth the time for leaf collection than we used to have to do manually. So, you know, that's an example of ways that we continue to try to incorporate um, equipment um, to offset the lack of, of hands-on staff. And then of course, as we mentioned before, um, you know, looking for opportunities um, if it should arise under a future bond uh, measure for priority parks projects in doing that assessment to see what our, our needs are so that we're ready if that opportunity should present itself. And then the last thing is really um, uh, just a little bit of, of a chart to kind of see, you know, where these departments fit in the overall public works organizational um, scheme. So parks, operations, and recreation services, you'll see on the bottom left is part of the public works operations division. Um, and we are housed um, out off of 22nd Street and, and Mission. Um, in, uh, and uh, uh, parks planning 
um, is under Robert Chandler. It's a separate section under the Planning and Development Division, and they are housed down at Civic in, in City Hall. Um, so any, you know it was relatively quick, but that's kind of the highlights. Is there any questions um, that we can answer for you? So you're not normally down at City Hall. I actually didn't know that. Your office. We, no, our, yeah, our office is out at the shops, what well, we call the shops complex off of 22nd with the rest of the operational division. Now, recreation staff, because there's not room in our parks building, um, you know, park, recreation used to be a separate department from parks. It was two separate entities until about, I guess, well, till I came to parks. So, um, and then, and then it was combined. Um, and so while they're under our un umbrella and we've become one, one unit, um, we don't physically have space to house recreation services. However, when the new um, building is being that, that is being built, the new operations building, um, which is probably I think about two and a half years away, but that process has started. But upon completion of that, recreation will physically be housed uh, with parks. We will be together. So while they're downtown, we you know I spend a lot of time going downtown and working with them and vice versa it's a lot it's a lot of travel back and forth but but we will ultimately be under one one roof so wonderful Paul yeah the uh you know there's all kinds of words about how money is flowing from the federal government down to states and cities and so forth like that it seems like it's quite a mishmash of different funding any ideas where any of that funding coming down from the federal government around COVID and some of these other bills um, might trickle down to the parks? So we've actually had some meetings about that um, relatively recently. Um, uh, there is about, in the budget committee hearings, um, they've identified um, approximately 8 million to which they hasn't, kind of been identified to kind of reimburse for departments for their COVID expenses um, to kind of offset the expenses that they've incurred, uh, incurred over the last uh, year plus. Um, and so one of the things that um, the budget committee is looking at, which has prompted conversations um, with some of the departments, including parks, um, is to kind of come up with um, a list of, of projects, uh, a needs list, in essence, of some projects that may fit under uh, the, the, the criteria for, for that money. Um, what they're waiting for is exactly what that criteria is. So what would be, you know, an acceptable project versus not um, to be able to be used under that money. So Parks is, is in the process of, of doing some assessments um, and it really can be used um, twofold. So one, it, it, uh, on an earlier time frame, potentially for projects for federal money, and then later um, uh, to be used uh, uh, towards if parks were to go out, uh, the city decided that there would be a parks bond. Um, so um, it's good and useful information to have. It's been lots of years since that needs assessment was done. And so, so we're actively in the process of doing that and, and hopefully that information, you know, will be, will prove useful um, in one avenue or, or another. But, but there have been some conversations about potential um, parks uses, but nothing definitive. Dave. Now, I had a question about, in, in terms of the funding, how do we consider equity and social justice uh, impacts when deciding which projects are going to be uh, developed or funded? How, how's that uh, process work? And do we track the uh, projects with a, an eye to social justice? So it, I, I think it depends if you're talking, I don't know if you're talking about CIP projects or if you're just talking about, you know, maintenance projects that, that we would do under the $50,000 threshold that would come from the operating budget. So I'm, I'm not, there's, cause it, the, the, potentially there's two different responses. So if it's a CIP, we actually have um, weighted criteria that we put every project through that is scored. There's 10 different um, criteria to which um, uh, um, the, uh, I guess the equity issue, um, a high needs area, um, is, is a weighted factor in that. 
Um, so it, in really in the, from the operational standpoint, safety is the number one driving factor. Um, two, obviously, you know, the cost and, and then what we what we can support through the operating funds that uh, that particular year. Um, but but the first thing is, is really what the amenity is or what the issue is from a safety standpoint um, to address that that first. And I'll just add that we use the we use the same criteria when we're looking at doing our park master plans and park development. So we look at um, areas that are underserved or that um, have a need for a certain type of park. You know, if they have a neighborhood park, but there's there's a need for a community park, um, we look at those criteria as well. So we try to address some of those underserved areas earlier. Okay. Thank you, Patricia. That's the word I was trying to think of, underserved. Thank you. May I ask and, a follow-up question too? Yes, of course. Um, You've mentioned the developer initiated parks uh, that sometimes they'll come in and want to build a park or build out a park and and develop it as part of a development. Is that considered in the with this equity lens um, in terms of where the the new park development will, will be? And because I assume that means that the money would not be going into SDCs, it would be going into that park in that new development. So uh, this um, process has not occurred yet under since I've been in this position. So it would be it would be done similar to um, utilities where the, the developer installs a utility and they and re, they are reimbursed their um, or they get credit on their SDCs to a, to accommodate or to account for the expenditures on the park. So it really kind of depends on where it's located. I mean, it's obviously situational where the development is occurring. Um, and so there's, for instance, a, a developer down in South Salem that might be interested in doing one. And there's a developer in kind of Northeast that that, might, that process might also work. And I guess the benefit is that it would happen sooner than it probably would if, if it goes into our queue you know, for construction. Okay, thank you. Great questions. Thank you, Dave. Um, Keith. Yeah, uh, Jennifer, you mentioned deferred maintenance backlog uh, and it growing. Um, it looked like maybe we're spending, I, I was just kind of curious what those amounts were. And it looks like maybe you're spending, if all the construction projects for this year, are, it looks like they're replacement somewhere around 1.4, 1.5 million this year. What is the, do you know what the full deferred maintenance backlog is? We don't, and that's what we're hoping to get through this assessment. Um, there was a lot of, over previous um, years, probably the last 10 to 15 years, where a lot of the multi-purpose courts, um, a lot of the tennis courts, a lot of the playgrounds, um, issues that came up were not addressed at the time. Um, and so it's only been within you know the last four or five years where we've made a concerted effort then to put money towards those projects specifically. Um, you know, the, the problem is with all the additional maintenance costs, we just, you know, we only have so much out of our operating budget that we, that we can do. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it, we're, we're hoping through that assessment process that it will give us an idea of exactly what we're talking about. If we're talking about, you know, $50 million, or if we're talking about $300 million, you know, I mean, kind of thing, we just really, honestly don't um, don't have a, a good real take. It's it's just a lot of piecemeal now, honestly, just trying to, you know, kind of put out more critical fires of issues, safety issues. Keith, does that answer your question? I think so. And I think that was maybe the only one I had. Surprising. Alan? Go ahead, Alan. Yes, uh, in reviewing, when we were, dialing through the slides on the recreation side, it looked like the personal service cost was pretty high for four FTEs. Is that personal service cost also in the summer folks? It does, it includes seasonal staff, okay. both softball um, and the, both the softball uh, section of rec uh, recreation services and Melinda's youth programs all have support seasonal staff. Um, so it, it does include that, yes. Well, I, I was hoping it did. <laughs> and about how many, uh, about how many uh, uh, seasonal folks do you, do you use on an average season? 
So under typical um, seasons, Billy in softball usually tries to bring on about 18 or 20 additional staff. Um, Melinda, it's closer, it's usually closer to about 12 to 15. I mean, it fluctuates, um, you know, obviously last year and, and as we go into this year, it's some modifying, modified programming levels, but under normal circumstances, you know, it's a, you know, between the two programs, it, you know, it's probably between 35 and 40 seasonal staff. And I can honestly attest to my granddaughter attended several of these, these programs. And where you find those great summer staff, I don't know, but they do a good job. Thank you. Yeah. So. Patricia, I have a question kind of going back to Dave's question. Um, you mentioned how Bill Regal is being prioritized, even though we didn't get the grant because there because it's a high needs area, underserved area. And I'm curious if if there's other parks, especially in some of the high needs areas that you have on the docket for maybe not if they're in this cycle, but the next cycle that are, are pretty high on that list to address some of the equity or underserved areas. Yes, um, well, so Gear Park is one of those ones that we're thinking um, it serves a wide area, you know, three miles um, area, service area, and probably also if it brings in people from outside the area for, for competitions. Um, and so that is one of our focuses as well to, to kind of focus on gear. Um, that's in a kind of a high needs area as well. And then also Stevens Yoshikai Park in Northeast um, we are, is on our list to do a master plan for that. It currently has a cricket pitch on it. So it is, it is getting used for a particular um, group but it is next to a school and it's in a high needs area. And then we also have, you know, our new purchase um, on Hazel Green Road. That's a little ways out as far as the master plan, but, but it's, um, it's probably one of those ones that could really be a, a unique, possibly kind of a sports center location because it's very close to I-5, it's got good access. Um, so we're kind of have all of our eye on all of those different, different parks. It seems like those could be good candidates for some of the land water conservation fund increases. Um, I, I know I shared that with the, the two of you last week, but just thinking about some of the development, although I recognize that the operation, the maintenance aspect of it is the tricky part. Developing the park is only one half of that. Keith, I saw your hand go up. Yeah, I was, I was also thinking of LWCF funds and, and grants, and, and I know LWCF has a lot more money coming to it now, so hopefully that'll eventually trickle its way down to the cities. But I, I was thinking about grants and, and um, does that show up in this budget if and when a grant is awarded or, or is that handled kind of separately? And I'm thinking specifically of a, of a letter Sprab wrote uh, three, four months ago now for a, I think it was a Department of Transportation grant application um, connecting Riverfront and uh, Pringle Creek. Um, and I wasn't sure, A, what the status of that was, if you knew anything, but also like if, if and when that's awarded, how does that fit into the, to the budgeting process? Uh, we just, well, first of all, we did not get that, that grant that you were mentioning, the Pringle Creek Trail grant. We did not get that one, unfortunately. Um, so at least in my budget, we, we keep the grants separate uh, because we don't know if we're going to get them or not. And so we kind of, like for Bill Regal, we, we kept aside enough money to construct that park in case we didn't get it. Um, so we just kind of keep it as a separate line item in our budget until we, we, we know for sure. Okay. And, and that that would be the same for parks operations. We don't we don't put it specifically in the budget because it's it's yet to be identified money. It's an unknown quantity, so we we don't account for it until money would actually a grant would actually be received. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much, Jennifer and Patricia. Really helpful to have that walkthrough and really have a better sense of the budget for the coming year. Thank you. Councilor Nordyke, thank you for joining us. Um, we, uh, we were planning to talk about the resolution or the, sorry, the, the motion in new business and the subcommittee. So our, we were going to go through informational reports first, but pending your schedule, I'm happy to provide some space here if you'd like to give some comment now. And if you need to leave, uh, it's up, up to you on that. Uh, thank you, Dylan. I appreciate that. And yes, I will accept your invitation to provide a little bit of updates right now. 
So uh, thank you all. Uh, you've probably already seen my written testimony that I submitted. Uh, thankfully, I was able to make a quick tweak to my schedule to join you all today. And I first want to thank you all for your public service. Uh, you guys are stewards of our parks and together with our city staff, our maintenance workers, our park rangers, our code compliance officers, uh, all the grounds crew people, uh, we have an incredible embarrassment of riches here in Salem when it comes to our parks network. I, my dog and I, Sierra, love Minto Brown specifically. Of course, you know, I'm in Ward 7. Uh, we have the best parks there. I said what I said. But um, <laughs> fight me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> that we, we all have great parks for sure, but I'm quite partial to all the potential running and bicycling routes um, and the off-leash dog area uh, for Minto. So um, earlier this week, I brought a motion to city council, which passed unanimously. And that was a motion to direct and empower SPRAB to draft policy recommendations for park usage. And let me give you a little more context about what I mean by that. You city staff will probably hand you a copy of the motion and the details therein. But I want to tell you a little bit more about why I brought that motion and why I wanted to bring SPRAB to the table on this one. Uh, I joined council a little over a year ago and uh, concerns about park usage have been on my radar screen ever since I joined council. The thing is our parks are extremely popular, especially since the pandemic hit. And I have received concerns from a lot of community members about uneven policing of park events, whether they're organized events permitted or not. Uh, concerns about monopolization of park facilities by specific groups so that other people can't use them. And just a desire overall, particularly from our BIPOC community and our other marginalized communities, concerns about, you know, feeling safe and having equitable access to our public park spaces. In addition to all those things, we are also getting a Rotary Amphitheater, which is going to be huge. I don't know to what extent, you've already discussed it, but I can tell you um, I'm a member of the Rotary Club of Salem and I know that the city's phone is ringing off the proverbial hook with people who want to come and use that space. Salem used to not be on the map for a lot of traveling acts, but this amphitheater is a game changer. We're going to get the Ironman competition this summer. That's expected to create $11 million in local revenue. But we're also going to get a lot of visitors, right? And that means that our parks are going to become even busier. So I felt like now would be a great time as we are slowly but surely starting to reopen our, our spaces even more so. And as the city returns to a permitting process, I thought now would be a great time to A, review existing practices, B, examine what the best practices are for managing uh, park spaces like that, and draft policy recommendations for city council's perusal. So I would just, here are just some thoughts to keep in mind. For example, should we have a first come first serve basis for certain park facilities? I can tell you that just anecdotally, I heard that there were some groups who would come down to places like Riverfront Park. They would just, you know, bring down their materials. I don't know if they were like tailgating chairs or coolers or fold up tables or whatever, but they would set up shop at one of the available spaces. And because there was no permitting process, they would just basically dominate the space for the duration of the day. And that happened over and over again during the pandemic. Now, for those of you who love camping, which I do, I can tell you that the first come first serve basis means that people who didn't have the time to plan ahead or maybe don't have the money to plan ahead, uh, you know, they'll show up at a campground and all the spots are taken. So how do, you, how do you manage competing uses for these spaces, right? Another question in mind is what about alcohol? We currently allow alcohol in certain parks for a fee and that alcohol can only be like under 14% uh, ABV which I think could impact, for example, some of the distilleries in the area who would love to be able to do a tasting, not you know a drinking fest, but a tasting 
of say some of our local distilleries. Another question would be, what about uh, sound amplification? Um, we, we know the city can switch on or off the power in certain park facilities, but what about the practical reality that a lot of times folks will just bring their own generators or their own battery powered devices. We have to balance the needs of everybody. And a lot of our parks are within earshot of neighborhoods of you know lots of seniors in the area, lots of families trying to put their kids to bed at a reasonable hour. So what are our rules for managing the sound, especially as it gets late at night, right? If we're gonna have some concerts down at Riverfront Park, uh, you know, a lot of people in my ward are going to hear, are they're gonna hear it. And so that would be another question, for example, do we want to allow sound amplification until 10 o'clock at night, nine o'clock, midnight? I honestly don't know, but I want, that's why I wanted to bring you guys to the table to help us identify what are the best practices for urban parks. Maybe, and I don't want you to have to reinvent the wheel. It could be that you could take a look at what other similar park systems are doing that have a similar population number, uh, a similar proximity to neighborhoods and schools and things like that. And as I mentioned, uh, a lot of folks have had concerns about policing. I've had constituents complain that police are next to uh, invisible at some events and highly present at others. And you know, there are a lot of public perceptions that are tied up in terms of how are available and how accessible and how equitable the usage is of our parks. So um, I've shared, I've tried to write all this out in my testimony to you tonight so that you know, it's not just a stream of consciousness discussion for me at this moment, but I want to tell you that was all these concerns were the impetus for this. Uh, I'm grateful for Dylan's leadership. I'm happy to, you know, come back and give feedback over time, but two, two recommendations I have for your consideration as you develop these draft recommendations. One, I encourage you to give opportunities for public input, just like you are right now particularly to our communities of color, particularly to marginalized communities, our LGBTQ plus community, for example, comes to mind and others. So I wanna make sure, I would strongly encourage you to reach out to those organizations and uh, make sure that they have an opportunity to weigh in on these matters. And secondly, as a lawyer, I know all too well that we have uh, sacred constitutional rights to free assembly, free speech and the right to bear arms. So any policy recommendations that you have, you, you're gonna have to work with a, a representative from the city attorney's office to make sure that what you're recommending would pass, con pass constitutional muster. Thankfully, you don't have to do that. That's what our city attorneys are, are for and they're fantastic. And I highly recommend keeping them in the loop every step of the way so that uh, you guys are um, rep recognizing everyone's rights to use the park. So um, that is why I wanted to come tonight. If you have any questions for me, let me know. But um, I just welcome an opportunity to really take a step back before we try to return to normal, whatever that looks like, and envision best practices for our increasingly popular park space. Thank you so much, Councillor, for that uh, insight and providing more context for us. Um, I had one question for you in terms of timeline. We had a quick conversation before the meeting looking at you know, obviously wanting to get out ahead of things like the amphitheater opening and like you said, reopening in general. And one thought we were talking about was possibly one of the July council meetings being a goal to try and have recommendations sent back to council and want to make sure that lines up with your desires. That sounds great. Um, I think that July will give you hopefully enough time to meet and discuss and to solicit public input. Um, you know, just, I don't know if you've done this before, but there are other, uh, for example, the steering committee for the performance audit of the police department, they sent out community surveys. That would be one way to help collect input. Uh, you know, if you need any assistance from me in terms of accessing some of the harder to reach groups, let me know. But yeah, I think that sounds great because that is the, roughly the anticipated start time for the Rotary Amphitheater. If you feel you need additional time, 
you know, like another month or so, I, I get that. I would rather have, you know, if you need like a couple more weeks to feel really confident in your recommendations to get city attorney input and so on, I understand. We do have a permitting process in place. It's not as if one doesn't exist, but is it the best it can possibly be? Uh, I firmly believe you need public input for public spaces. So there you go. Certainly. Thank you. Yes. And I and we'll be talking about this uh, as a group in a moment here, but I think our uh, my plan is for us to hopefully set up the, the subcommittee structure and then I think that subcommittee will meet and figure out the full scale and scope of the timeline, but we can set up some of that now and I think that's a good goal, at least to have some some ideas in July and then we can come back to you if we need a little bit more time. Terrific. Um, anyone else have any questions or clarifications for Councillor Nordyke? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Thank you so much. You're welcome to stick around. As I mentioned, uh, we do have Robert Chandler here, and um, we have uh, someone from the city from the city attorney's office, um, Mark Weinstein or Weinstein. Sorry, we, we haven't went over that at the start um, with us. So I want to. We will have that conversation if you'd like to be here, but otherwise, we will make sure to let you know where the next steps are. I got to get going, but th once again, thank you for your community service. It's sincerely appreciated. You guys have a great night. All right, thank you so much, Counselor. Bye. Okay, well, let us go back through our, um, let us go through our updates right now, our informational reports, and then we can come back to this as new business at the end before we wrap up. So let's go into our urban forestry update. Mylan, you're on. If there's anything you'd like to share outside of the update you provided to us so far, or any recent updates. No, just that we're still working on 98% uh, of our work is probably storm work up to this point, so hoping to get back to some some normal work soon. Do you have an estimate of how much more time you think it's to get back to somewhat normalcy? Um, at least a few months. I mean, we're still doing scouting where we're finding, um, you know, locations that weren't called in by the public through our uh, service requests system uh, so there's there's a lot of a lot of work sorry i have my three-year-old me and some neighbors coming by but um you know there's a lot of stuff out there we still haven't seen so just just counting on us to to find things out there uh through scouting through a lot of our inventory that we will eventually find that but I, you know i think midsummer we'll probably be back to to normal work and uh, get back to to um, sort of some of the other things we had going before the storm. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the board? Yeah, Paul. I, this is probably more just to show that I read your report. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, it uh, referenced um, walnut trees at the Deer Park. Um, uh, park development, and I will assume they were black walnuts. And I know from, from my far past that black walnut is a very valuable wood, but that leads into a sort of a larger question since you're having to harvest a lot of uh, trees. Is, are any of that, is any of that timber, so to speak, um, put out to bid for hardwood or something like that, or is it just uh, disposed of? You know, great question. Uh, we do put black walnut out to bid, which usually goes to a company in Portland called Gobi Walnut. Uh, we put some of the white oak out to bid, but uh, for the storm specifically, we've we've gathered approximately uh, up to 50 logs of, of value that are larger logs uh, that have valuable timber in it. And we're, we're in the process of uh, working with Jennifer and, and Mark Bechtel on getting our own City Mill uh, at some point in the near future. And we also are working closely with Marion County um, to mill some lumber for us, which we give all of our, all the trees that we do cut down, any valuable wood uh, for firewood or for milling goes to the Marion County Juvenile Facility, which they turn into revenue. Uh, we don't actually, you know, get any of that revenue ourselves. So that's something that we could look to in the future for 
for more revenue opportunities, but we are so short staffed at the moment that that would be something that would be out of our purview at the moment, but it's something definitely to look towards the future. But yes, um, the black walnuts, uh, we have numerous sort of options for, for that in the future. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions for Mylan? Okay, hearing none. Thank you so much, Mylan. All right, thank you. Let's go into our parks and natural resource planning update. Um, Patricia, anything you'd like to share that was not on the report? Um, I don't think so. I think it's all it's all there. Nothing new to update. I had a question for you. When we were on the uh, wonderful bird tour, we did have a chance to do the, or we, we were walking over by from parking lot one over by the duck pond there. And there's the kind of consistently flooded pathway right now. And I, I understand it was Mike helped explain some of the, some of the biological reasons that that's flooding right now with beavers and other uh, animals. But I'm wondering if there's been considerations of a boardwalk and I know the cost is probably a, an inhibiting factor there, but I was wondering if there's ever partnerships with like Eagle Scouts or other groups in Salem on trails. Um, I know that they've helped in like Chandler Park and some of the other parks in the city. Yeah, that's probably a question more for Jen because that would be an operational cost and then there's a maintenance cost and boardwalks can get very slippery as well. Um, so yeah, I don't know, Jen, whether you've considered that in that location. We have not talked about that specifically for that location. We certainly do um, Eagle Scout projects. That's a, a regular routine um, uh, of, of projects that we do. Um, we haven't specifically spoken about that one. Um, you know, we provide all the materials for the Eagle Scouts. Um, it's really just their labor. Uh, to do it. Um, and then certainly we do evaluate, you know, the ongoing maintenance costs for things, but um, I certainly can, uh, you know, talk to staff with regard to uh, the potential and, and see what an estimate of, of doing something like that would cost to, to see if it was cost prohibitive at this time, or if it was something that um, maybe needed to be identified as a future CIP project or something. I would appreciate that. Um, just as you have time, it's not immediately pressing, but I, I do feel like there, it would be wonderful if there was a way, especially given that um, it seems like the beaver situation is going to be a consistent problem, at least for a while. So if there's a way to make that area more accessible, um, but I also understand there's a lot of, a lot of steps to get to that point. Yeah, we can, we can do some initial evaluation to, to kind of at least get some kind of ballpark and to see the feasibility of it. No problem. Perfect. Paul. Yeah, I, and one of the things that was interesting on that tour was the <clears throat> emphasizing the concept that Mental Brown is not just a park, but it's also a wildlife refuge. And in some ways, um, um, so it's a balance between obviously a beaver dam and all that, the dynamics around that obviously is a good educational opportunity <clears throat> if it were as a wildlife refuge, but it create some issues around it being used as a park. So, but um, I personally kind of, because it is such a special park, wildlife refuge to, to see the wildlife emphasized uh, as well as just the trail use. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. It's always a balance um, of you know, access for humans and access for all the other creatures. And I would and add, yes, oh, sorry, go ahead, Patricia. I was going to say, maybe, maybe Dylan, we need to get some, you need to get some uh, waterproof socks. <laughs> Just wade right through. Um, well, and that's where, you know, if there's something like a boardwalk, it could ideally continue to let the wildlife flood it, but, and you could have that a little bit more harmonious, but I, I see that there are definitely challenges. And we had a similar conversation during our tour. And one thing we talked about was signage and um, the ranger was sharing that that is definitely a goal for the future is to try and add more signage, but not have sign pollution, which I thought was a good consideration to be aware of as we think about, like you're saying, Paul, how do we advertise this and communicate it more as a wildlife refuge and some of the species you'll see and, and you know, and the nature that's out there, but also not just put signs everywhere. Anything else for Patricia from the board? 
I guess I'll just add, um, unless Jennifer, I might be stealing Jennifer's thunder here, but um, ODFW and parks put some um, turtle nesting mounds out um, in, in the area where they're, they're kind of known to be hanging out and nesting. And, and there's, uh, we, took out a we took out a paved section of trail that went out to the old boat dock, um, that really decrepit boat dock, which was also removed. And so this year they're working on um, um, enhancing the nesting habitat there and by adding these kind of just these kind of gravel and dirt mounds um, that the turtles like. I will just add that they were actually working on those and trying to get those finished up yesterday. Keith, did you have a question? No, I, th I thought I saw you come off mute, sorry. Anyone else? Okay, Jen, over to you if there's anything you'd like to add in addition to your report. So just uh, really quick, um, since it hadn't happened when I wrote my report, today was a homeless campsite cleanup at Wallace. Um, and the area was, the focus area was the Fir Grove area. Um, and so we just uh, got a, a report from, from Mark on that, that it was, this, it was successful. Um, three days ago, signs were put up. Um, uh, on barricades indicating that the, that portion of the park would be closed for, for maintenance. Um, and so they were successful in with the, with the assistance of the social service providers and some of the um, outside entities in moving those folks out um, of that area. So we were able to get that cleaned up, provide mow, mow the grass. Um, and then as soon as that was done, the signs, um, and I think it was last month, I, I provided kind of what those signs Burbage would look like, but the recreational day use only no camping signs were then installed in that Fir Grove area, um, hopefully to eliminate the, the, the campers going back to that area so that it could be used for public use. Um, and, um, and then uh, they, uh, after they completed that, that work in, in the Fir Grove area, they went over to the area outside the berm and cleaned up just the abandoned campsites in that area. Um, and so all in all, it was, a, it was a successful day in some relocation of the campers and actually getting some, some cleanup and some maintenance done in those areas. So, and next Thursday, uh, it's every Thursday this, this in the month of May, I think I referenced that in my report, but next Thursday, um, they'll be working underneath the Union Street pedestrian bridge trestle and all the areas south uh, to the boat ramp um, along the path to Wallace Road. Outside of that, I don't have anything else to add. Thank you for that. Does anyone have any questions? Keith? Yeah, I guess um, thinking about kind of the intersection of, of camping and uh, the recreation, Jennifer, is uh, just, you know, I've been playing softball uh, the past several weeks as part of the, the rec league, and, um, and I've been thinking about how the campsites there at Wallace, is that impacting our, our summer reservations uh, for the softball complex, just the, the smoke in the evenings has been pretty bad some nights uh, from, from campfires down there. And, and just, I was, I've, I've been concerned about if, if it's had a negative impact in terms of the revenue for the parks, uh, looking ahead to this summer, if that's something that's come up. It, it has, um, it has definitely decreased the, the revenue stream, not only um, from the standpoint that you mentioned, but also from safety security um, issues. Folks, quite honestly, are just nervous um, about um, holding things. And especially if it's, uh, it's, it's, I guess, a large, it's a large concern for adults who are participating in leagues or uh, that are, uh, are in that area, but certainly anything youth oriented um, for, for tournaments and so forth. So uh, it, it definitely has had, has had a, a negative impact both last year and, and this year. Okay. Um, well, then you mentioned kind of situational awareness training for, for staff. And I just was wondering, you know, as we approach kind of the June one 
end of camping, uh, I, I would expect that's going to probably escalate the potential for negative encounters. Um, and so is there kind of a plan to work with the city police uh, in terms of recognizing that potential for escalation as, as deadlines approach? Um, well, there's cer certainly continued co uh, collaboration with SPD, um, not only relative to the cleanups, but with regard to um, the impact and um, kind of safety concerns, not only for our staff, but for the public. So th that dialogue certainly continues. Um, I know with exec leadership staff, they, they you know, have continual meetings to discuss you know, opportunities for improvement in ways that they um, can help address those, those issues. Um, so that's kind of an ongoing um, uh, effort. Um, so, you know, one of the things that, that we want to do that I actually just spoke with um, Peter Fernandez, uh, the public works director about last week is um, we want, want to have um, kind of, we, we haven't had opportunity ourselves um, to meet Chief Womack. It's just been kind of in, you know, kind of virtual meetings a couple of times in, in very different scenarios. So one of the things that we want to, to do is to kind of have an opportunity to, to sit down with him now that he's been here for a few months um, and kind of talk about in an informal way, but a ver very direct one-on-one -on -one way on how um, SPD can support park staff, what we can do to make it easier for them to um, be able to do that, um, you know, what what they can and, and, and can't realistically do uh, to support um, uh, enforcement in the parks. So, you know, we want to have uh, create that dialogue with them to, to see where there's opportunities um, and, and certainly, you know, having that conversation to, to make him aware <laughs> of, you know, the concern um, about that, uh, you know, we would take advantage of that. So, you know, we're, we're, we're trying, although we have not had that direct conversation ourselves yet, but, but other folks have. Okay, that sounds good. And, and one more just kind of related to the budget presentation. I think before you had talked about the city re was going to reimburse parks for some of this cleanup. Um, mm -hmm. I guess what's kind of the status of that? Is that something being factored into next year's budget uh, or, um, you know, in some of the restoration work that's going to have to take place in some of these campsites uh, over the next year? Has that been factored into the budget? So uh, for this current year, um, they, they did increase parks budget to offset those costs that, that have been incurred. Um, we attempted to then forecast out, this was a, uh, probably two or three months ago, um, and then we attempted to for, kind of forecast out through June what we anticipated those, those costs would be um, for the level of service that we had done thus far. Um, and so they have reimbursed parks uh, for that. And then in the budget, yes. Uh, for the 21-22 year, uh, 22 year um, they have identified, uh, because obviously these issues continue, will roll into next fiscal year, um, so they have identified uh, money. It's not in our parks operating budget per se in that thing, but they have identified money to to um, reimburse parks, offset par those costs, however you want to, however you want to phrase it. Um, for uh, for all those costs that are being incurred, we track that through a specific project number and through you know specific ways, so that that way it helps identify that money very clearly as to what those costs are. Um, so, but yes, that is going to happen. Great, thank you. Oh, uh -huh. Are there any other questions for Jennifer, Mickey? I had a quick question for Jennifer, and this goes back onto the budget thing. I, I had forgotten, I wrote down a note here and I wanted to get back to it. In terms of the Department of Corrections labor, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sad to see them <laughs> go because they do an awful lot of work and it's just been great to have that collaboration. Um, you mentioned Marion County, um, mm -hmm. and that brought up a question, what about Polk County, do they have any kind of a crew since we do have some properties in, you know, in Polk County? Well, we've actually reached out everywhere from up to Coffee Creek um, down through Albany um, and Corvallis. 
you know, part of the issue is there's a couple issues. One, sometimes they already have contractual obligations with, you know, state agencies or other agencies. So they have a limited number of crews. And so it's just prohibitive for them to, to assist us. Um, you know, some by the time, if it's too far away, and I know Polk County, Polk County doesn't necessarily find if it's too far away, by the time they come down here and then drive back at the end of the day, um, it, you know, we pay a flat rate. And so it, 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 they don't, aren't necessarily interested in doing it because it's too long to travel. Like for example, Coffee Creek. Um, so Polk County though, uh, they have a very small department. So no, they do not have a crew that is available for us. We did reach out and, and ask them, but you're hundred percent, right? It's a huge blow to us not having them. They, um, you know, economically it's, you know, been wonderful for us. I mean, accumulatively, it's a large sum that we would pay each year, but, you know, the rate per day for the number of uh, adults in custody that would get and the amount of work that they would be accomplished uh, to offset not having staff to, to, to do that same type of uh, maintenance work um, is huge for us. Um, you know, this last year, just even with COVID, it was very fluctuating even before Mill Creek closed because of COVID as soon as somebody would get, you know, obviously, uh, you know, get, uh, where they had to quarantine, then the crew would be down and then they'd have to wait 14 days and then somebody else in the crew might potentially, you know, been exposed and then they would shut down again. So it was very off, off, you know, off and on um, this past year, which is, has certainly complicated, um, you know, our maintenance level and, and we've gotten extremely behind just not having them. So the loss of them in totality is, is huge for us. And so that's why we have reached out and, um, you know, we're, we're pursuing other methods, um, whether that's through private contracting companies to help offset some of the, the maintenance, especially in the right of way areas, because a, a lot of the inmate crews really focused on right of way work. And, and as we mentioned in the, as I mentioned in the budget, you know, that's gas tax money um, that we receive and, and that's where it needs to be used. So, you know, we're, we're pursuing going um, out. We wrote up a scope of work for private companies to um, get some bids in for them to be able to perform some of that work. But, but even that being said, so, you know, we get a primary and a secondary hopefully, but even that being said, you know, that, that is not going to make up for four inmate crews. So we continue to look for, for opportunities. We continue to reach out to correctional facilities to keep us in mind should their existing contracts, um, you know, expire or going to be exhausted as, as opportunities. But, at this point, Marion County is it for us. Okay, thank you for that really detailed explanation. It makes a lot of sense. And like you said, I'm sorry to see the loss. You know, I remember them in the estimates for the SPIF grants and you know, you know, mm -hmm. it was just a really, <laughs> I, I don't know if you call it an asset, but it was just such so helpful to us just moving forward with the development of our parks and well, and you know, improvements. And so anyway, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anyone else? Okay, um, Becky, you are up. I provide you with a chance if there's anything you want to share that wasn't in your update. Um, I think I included everything in the update. I guess um, I don't typically at do attachments, but I did this time. I wanted to make sure everybody had a copy of the uh, we, instead of the annual rec guide that we usually do that in the past has been kind of like a catalog format, um, you know, a, anywhere from 12 to 16 pages, uh, we just went with a front and back trifold flyer that just kind of directed people uh, to our registration, online registration uh uh, component just to get more information. So it was really kind of a, just a quick overview of the programs that we had offered. Mm -hmm. um, so I put that on there and then I attached um, recent work with the emergency operations center staff and legal to come up with the facility use COVID-19 addendum. So I wanted to have that um, attached just so that you can see um, kind of how we're approaching 
any events and activities using city property right now are completing that form. And if it's a private event, like a wedding, something like that, they just complete the form. If it's a public event where the public are going to be uh, essentially uh, participating in the event, whether it's a run or a, like a community festival company picnic that's open to other fo folks, then they have to submit a safety plan that is reviewed by the EOC and legal staff and parks and rec staff. So, um, but nothing really new. Um, I think everything's included in, in that write-up. So what does EOC stand for? Well, I, uh, emergency operations center. And oh, so great. there's an EOC right now there was for COVID, um, and pretty much, uh, I mean, it still is in existence. Um, but it, it's not like it's a, uh, a location, you know, during the ice storm, things like that, you'll hear where Jennifer and other folks, um, uh, Mark, uh, with, uh, public work staff, uh, they staff it. So there's a kind of a triage of phone calls and inquiries that are, you know, trees that have fallen, things like that. This operation center was established a while ago. And now um, we work with primarily a contact and legal related to COVID information, as well as the emergency preparedness manager for the city and fire, Greg Walsh. Mm -hmm. So those are my two contacts, but that's what EOC stands for. Gotcha. And one other question is just um, with the stride 5k and 10ks, I was curious when you expect to have dates assigned for those for this upcoming season. So those dates have been assigned. Um, they are part of the, uh, I think the, the document that was attached here just indicates that they are occurring. Uh, the next one is on the, I think it's the 12th of June. Um, and then, uh, there's one every Saturday after that, but those dates, uh, should be on the city's website. Um, there'll be one each Saturday, um, June, July, August, September, and then one in October. Great. I might've been looking at an outdated page then because I was only seeing the oh. 2020 dates. No, I'm only okay. I'm on the site now. I'm only seeing the 2021 showing up. Oh, uh, just good. flagging that for you um, to okay. update when you have a chance. Thank you. I did have a question. Yeah, Dave. Um, Becky, I was wondering about how our, the differently abled uh, population has access to our recreation programs. And I was wondering on top of that too, is the, what kind of supports we have for other languages in our programs? Mm-hmm. No, that's a really good question. Um, so we do, um, we service that. We've had uh, teams in our softball leagues before um, that uh, there was a, a team a few years ago that uh, all the participants on that particular team were deaf. Uh, we provided uh, an ASL interpreter out there for that. Uh, the same goes for our youth programs. Um, on the registration card, there is actually a statement in there where if uh, a participant is uh, in a wheelchair or and wants to do our tennis programs, per se, or they, um, you know, are in a situation where they speak maybe a different language um, and aren't uh, English isn't their first uh, language. We can war ASL, things like that. We do have an interpreter service and a line item in our budget to provide interpreters um, for, like I said, usually it's an ASL interpreter um, that we provide, but um, we specifically put in our information that uh, accommodations are, are welcomed and we will provide. Uh, we just asked for, I think it's a 72 hour notice to be able to do that. Okay, super, thanks. Mm -hmm. I had a question. Go ahead. Uh, in looking at the brochure, there was pictures of various kids and some other people in it. Um, maybe I missed it. I, I didn't see a lot of ethnic diversity of the people in the pictures. 
Okay. Yeah. So that is one of those things where we try to use pictures from our programs. There's been other times in some of the publications where, uh, you know, I mean, staff will go out. We have actually staff in our desktop publishing that'll go out and take photos of our programs. Um, but sometimes the programs are in a situation where, we, I mean, they were at a small period of time and the person couldn't get out there to take photos. So they end up, what we try to avoid is avoid using like the stock photos, things like that. Uh, but I will bring that up with uh, recreation staff, both in our desktop publishing and also uh, the ones that are in charge of the, the photos. Um, we try really hard to, you know, provide a, a glimpse of all of the folks that we have in our programs. Um, and that is every, like I was just saying with David's question that have different accommodations, maybe um, different cultural backgrounds, those types of things. So I will definitely bring that up that uh, that, that was something that was noted. Yeah, because I, I know that just in looking around the parks, there's a lot of, of of soccer clubs out there. And some of them are pretty heavily weighted toward, you know, the Hispanic community. Um, and uh, seems like there could have been a picture there, but uh, anyway, just, just uh, it was only a two page thing. It wasn't your full yeah. thing, but still, you know, today's world, that's, uh, I think it's important that we look like we're inclusive. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Paul, that, for making that, that point. Alan, go ahead. Mind. Keep in mind that uh, I'm pretty sure they're not, not allowed to use people's photographs without having a release, a particular thing will be published in a brochure, and a lot of parents do not want their kids' pictures made public. So we've had that uh, come up before. Um, there's actually in our registration form, there is a, a statement in there about a photo release. Um, you are correct. Um, I've known there are people, you know, for instance, we've had lots of kids in the foster care system, things like that. And, uh, some of those, uh, foster care, uh, parents are very, they will make a special point of telling us that, you know, not to include those photos and things like that. So there is some of that, but, um, we, we definitely want to offer a full, I, uh, encapsulation of the participants that we have in our programs. And we uh, are pretty diverse, but um, I, I understand those photos, could, um, you know, was noted and we'll try to do a little bit better in the future of making sure we get some good photos that, that show that. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? All right, well, thank you so much, Becky. Really appreciate mm -hmm. your receptiveness to all of this and having the conversation. Yeah. All right, well, we will move into our new business, which we can go back to what Councillor Nordyke shared with us. And as I mentioned, we have Robert Chandler here who can share a little bit more about the, what this subcommittee will look like. Um, just to frame this up, it, it does seem like the best approach to address the motion and the, um, the desire for recommendations is a subcommittee format where a smaller subset of SPRAB members can really dig into this issue, bring that back to the full board, and we can then make a recommendation that will be issued to council. Um, a few things that we'll need to decide tonight is one, we'll need to formally vote to create a subcommittee. We'll need to decide who would like to be on that subcommittee. Uh, we have to have two people as a minimum, and we can have no more than four to avoid a quorum. Uh, so that just is thinking as we're talking through all this, keep in mind that we can only have a few of us participate. We should be thinking about the end date. As I mentioned, I think there's some validity for looking at July, at least as a target date, but um, we can revisit that as well. And then we need to decide on who will chair the subcommittee as well tonight. Um, from that, we can set up a first meeting. We'll, we can discuss setting up a first meeting and go from there on scheduling. But that's just a broad overview to set everyone's thinking as we go into, I'll pass it over to Robert, but hopefully you can be thinking of this as something you would like to be part of. So Robert, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Dylan. And again, I'm Robert Chandler, Assistant Director of Public Works. My pleasure to be back with SPRAP again. 
Um, so as, as you heard from and, and read, uh, council passed a motion basically directing the Salem Parks Recreation Advisory Board to uh, review and look at pol and make policy recommendations broadly on park usage. Um, there, are, there are a lot of sub stories below that, but that's basically it. How do you want to use parks and any recommendations? Um, the, uh, I have been, uh, will be the lead staff person working with this subcommittee. Um, I, I, my view, and I just got the assignment technically yesterday, but my view is that there's like a four step process that will be involved with this. Uh, first, of course, is reviewing our existing practices, existing practices, policies, uh, permitting rule, uh, permits, rules, regulations, and there are a lot of them. Um, and uh, secondly, is really identify where are the gaps, what are the issues to be addressed. Um, and that might have an, as, as a form of an output, you know, in the form of questions, should we increase the alcohol by volume content for parks other than Riverfront Park and Bush's Pasture Park, for example. Um, then there is a, uh, a step of research that would be what are the best practices of comparable cities or park districts compared to how we do it. And then uh, it's a, the act of, of compiling, crafting the draft report that will come back to SPRAP. Uh, throughout that process, there needs to be uh, a way to engage the community in, in their views of uh, gaps and issues in areas where we can uh, do better. Um, and that will be throughout, and I'm not entirely sure how we'll implement that. Um, and um, then the report will come back to uh, spread the, the board as a whole, and then the, the task passes to uh, the collective to uh, review and uh, look at the report. And then once you endorse it, uh, send it on to uh, the to council. Um, my uh, having done some of these in, in other other uh, venues, generally it's it's like here is the issue, here is the current policy. Uh, here are the options, here's our discussion, and there's a recommendation. You just run through that as a set of those. Um, and that's essentially it. It is not for the weak hearted uh, to be on this uh, subcommittee. I've already uh, got a homework list that um, would probably take, uh, depending how fast you read, uh, between four and six hours just to go through. Um, and then uh, there's an expectation that uh, you will bear a hand on, on the research and the crafting and contributions and uh, so it's uh, it'll be a fun ride, fun ride, but uh, it is more than uh, receiving uh, reports and reviewing what uh, what is given to you. You'll be, you'll be the crafters as well. Um, that's what I've got, Bill, so far. Questions? Thank you, Robert. Could you speak to the frequency of meetings that you're thinking about and um, anything on that? Um, I don't know for sure, um, and part of it is we're um, schedules are. Uh, I don't know, and particularly because a small group of just two plus me uh, is fairly simple. Uh, if it's four and we invite, uh, bring other people from staff along, uh, it's a little more complicated to set things up. Probably no less frequently than twice than, than every couple of weeks. Um, and um, Councilor Norak did talk about uh, requirements for legal review. Uh, we will have legal working with us directly and continually, uh, Mark Weinstein, is uh, the assigned uh, member of the city attorney's office and certainly the uh, parks and recreation staff and uh, natural resources planning management staff that are with us as well. So it'll be, um, it'll be a lot of support um, and I'm gonna hook in some uh, public outreach people as well. That makes sense. And uh, Mark, I'd, as this can be for the first meeting, but I think one of the big questions I have is, how to appropriately manage public engagement in terms of if you have that at the start of every meeting or if that's something where there can be dedicated listening sessions built in. I know city council's work sessions do not have public comment, like virtual comment and other times they do allow comments. So things that we can dig into later, but I just wanna plant that now as a thought of how we can best approach it. I, I appreciate it, Chair McDowell. And if I might, and I had mentioned this to, um, Robert Chandler and, and staff, just keep in mind when you're considering the frequency of the scheduling that the subcommittee is going to be governed by all of the public meeting laws as the SPRAB as a whole. 
So it is going to need to be something that the public, um, the, the meeting times will need to be announced and the public needs to be aware that of when the meetings are going to be in the agendas for the meetings, et cetera. So it's, it's going to still have those same formalities. And, and also on that topic, um, uh, to avoid uh, inadvertently violating those laws, uh, you must always be blind copied on everything. So you can't do any of the um, inadvertent electronic uh, collaboration outside of, of the public uh, site. Any other thoughts or questions? Open it up. Woody. Will these all be Zoom meetings, even if later on they be uh, open up to where people can meet in person later? As far as I know, they will all still be Zoom meetings. That is the city policy. I don't see that changing during the next couple of months of our uh, committee's work. Mickey, did you have a question? Oh, one quick one. Um, just how far ahead of time do the meetings need to be announced? Is it a week or uh, I just didn't know for sure. If I may, Chair McDowell, this question was broached. Um, the, the public meetings law does not um, specify a minimum amount of time. It's more about making sure that um, adequate notice is, pre pre is provided to the public so that they're aware of the meeting and able to attend if they can. Um, that said, my recommendation would be that um, the frequency that sort of regular meetings be established so that it can be published and announced. And then if there's a need for an additional meeting outside of what is regularly scheduled, that can be provided as well. Um, special meetings have a requirement of at least a 24 hour notice. So if you know that based on your time frame, um, once the subcommittee is put together, that the subcommittee is wanting to meet once a week or twice a week at a given time, that it just established that, that it then make its public announcements of the dates that it's gonna be regularly meeting. And then if there's a need for an additional meeting beyond that, it can certainly call for a special meeting. Thank you. And um, generally you know, looking at the work, there's a certain, this type of work, um, a committee kind of, there's, there's a, a building synergy that occurs. So you can't really get, sometimes you can't get a lot of done if you have a 45 or one hour meeting. So I would envision that when we do meet, it would be for a longer period of time to get the momentum going and to work together. Um, fewer longer meetings rather than a lot of shorter meetings, um, which is less burdensome on the staff for preparing for it. Um, Dylan and I chatted earlier about how to arrange the meetings and will likely be a doodle poll. Um, uh, you know, for me, I'm free between about six in the morning and 10 o'clock at night. So there's some flexi I have flexibility but some are better morning, some noontime, sometime after hours uh, to get uh, basically a lot of work done uh, in chunks of time rather than a lot of smaller meetings is what I envision trying to do. So to keep that in mind too, if you're going to uh, offer to serve on the subcommittee, uh, the time commitment and the constraints you might have on your own schedules and uh, personal lives. Paul. Yeah. I. You know, again, I just read this before the Zoom meeting started. You know, that's a very broad charge um, and dealing with some very highly charged issues if we're talking about policing and uh, social equity. So, um, uh, so that, so, and you've sort of addressed this a little bit in terms of the kind of the detailed planning and outreach. So it, it seems like it might be worthwhile, but it's uh, 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 the issues of access and who gets this and who gets that are, are you know, those are, are pretty broad issues. So, um, and complex issues. So it's, it would not be a simple task. <laughs> no, uh, I agree. And we may find that some things uh, end up being, as they're developed, we realize that's outside of the charter of SPRAP uh, and pass it on to another group. Um, the other thing that um, 
is it's easy when we start talking policies to drop down into the details of implementation. Um, but our goal is primarily policies that council have a chance to consider and uh, you know, enact or otherwise, and then working with the staff to actually enact how the policy goes. You're, you're, you're absolutely correct about how complicated it can be, um, but I think if we stay at the appropriate level of detail, we'll get it done um, in a reasonable time. Whatever, we, however you choose to find reasonable. Thank you. Thank you. And I would note um, for anyone that joins the subcommittee, if you haven't already watching the council debate about this or the conversation around it on Monday, there was some good clarification in terms of what falls within the scope and what doesn't. And I think we as a subcommittee can revisit that, but um, there, I, I think you're right, Paul, this is, this is a very big charge and it will be really interesting. And I think that um, it, it will be very helpful to look at other cities and other jurisdictions to figure out what there's, where there's some best management practices that we can avoid just starting from scratch in this. Correct. And I will just add that the first homework assignment is about 35 minutes of watching that segment of city council meetings on Monday. Dave. Um, just trying to understand this. It sounds like we have one SCRAB meeting before we have to adopt whatever this is. Because we'll have the June meeting, but they want the final report in July. So that means at most we have two SPRAB meetings. So I'm not understanding the timeline, why it's so short. Um, I don't understand the explanation of why it's so short and why this is such a fire. So. Part of it is because the amphitheater is expected to open in July, August timeframe. And there's a lot of the conversation around the city council on Monday was that the once the amphitheater is open, that could cause some um, competition for the space. And that that so ideally trying to get at some of this earlier could be better. I think you're right that we need at least two SPRAB meetings between now and then. So their July 26th um, time frame might be might make more sense to allow for that space. But Robert, I would open it up to you as well for any other comments on time frame. So one of Robert's rules is always figure out who is they, particularly they is you or me. So that July target date, and I think that was a term target, came from conversations uh, among Patricia, I think Jennifer's part of it, Dylan and me. So if we decide as we get into this that we need more time, we as they, can say, can we have another month or another two months, whatever it happens to be. So there's flexibility in there, but there's also a, uh, I wouldn't call it sense of urgency, but a certain momentum that we do want to uh, take advantage of and, and continue. Does that help, David? That does. I mean, it's not like we didn't know that this uh, amphitheater was going to open for quite a long time now. So. Alan. I'm also concerned about the timeline because even once we finish our work and turn it over to council, it's, they've got a process that takes some time before they can adopt anything. Uh, they have to have a, their own public hearing. And uh, so, and keep in mind, there is a permitting program in place already. The city's had it for some time. So worst possible case, they just revert to their existing permitting program uh, to, to get things started as we reopen. Absolutely. Not, I mean, it, it, nothing, I mean, there is a uh, robust permitting process, also part of your homework assignment. Uh, there are rules in place, regulations in place regarding everything from alcohol content and what is allowed in each park. Uh, hours of quiet for amplified sound or no amplified sound to the sound permitting process. Uh, everything from uh, event permits and rules for alcohol and uh, concession stands to uh, 400 square feet or more of ticking requires a permit uh, approved by the fire marshal. I mean, so things aren't stalled out or stopping as we do this. It's just a question of doing and identifying policies that can improve how we implement uh, people's use of usage of our parks. You are absolutely correct. 
And I, um, sorry, Woody, one moment. I would just add too that we, you're right, we're not locked into this timeline. I think part of it, you use the word momentum, Robert. And I think that trying to capitalize on the interest of this now and see if we can get something done rather than falling into the potential for something to be drug out for a long time, especially recognizing the council would then have their own process. But wanting to keep it within a reasonable time frame, we're actually able to do a good job. Woody? Yeah, I brought uh, the uh, situation up at the Riverfront Park last August, I think, to SPRAB. And uh, then I was talking about when they dropped a permit and there was that, uh, that church group that was there every night of the week. And anyway, it seemed that um, city council watching their uh, proceedings that uh, seemed like their concerns were related to the May 1st something that happened May 1st in um, Riverfront Park and somebody else can really expand on that. I, I don't know the details, but, um, and then the amphitheater coming online, so. I am not sure what the question was, Woody. I, I heard some good comments. Well, Sorry. It just seemed like when I was watching the city council, their concern was, seemed to come from, it was a group that occupied the park on May 1st that, and, and obviously we're in this period here where there are no permits issued. Mm -hmm. And so there was, you know, anyway, I just thought that's what uh, council was concerned about and why wanted us to take another look at procedures. Okay, it's the uh, council discussions are fairly wide ranging. Um, and some aspects that were discussed are really, actually really are much more uh, police policies than, than the parks policies. But among the things that we may end up discussing uh, as part of the, the subcommittee is uh, policies related to enforcing existing rules. Um, and you can look at the issues that uh, occurred on May 1st um, but you can also look at issues related to people who smoke in parks or drink alcohol in parks or have their dog off leash in parks, all of which are rule violations. And how do we want to approach policing and enforcement of, infra of enforcement of rules and infractions in, in our parks? That's a policy call. How we actually do it is a different thing. Um, so yes, they're, 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 uh, the policies can be wide ranging um, in and we'll see where it goes. So thinking about the timeline, if um, I'm, I'm wondering if we if we want to set a target timeline of that, maybe it's a reevaluation at the July SPRAB meeting, perhaps as that, that's the check in point with uh, the hopes of having a of having recommendations, but the expect, but not setting a firm date in the sense that we can extend if we need to, or I guess putting an option for extension at that point. Would that, um, and, and I think Robert, once we all have it, once the subcommittee has a chance to look at the, the mountain of material you're sending our way um, and having our first meeting to look through things, it might become clear how much time we actually need. Um, Alan and Dave, do you feel like that is, uh, that's more in line with what you're thinking or do you still have concerns about even aiming at the July one for that kind of update? Well, I, maybe I'm optimistic. I, I believe in doing it as prudently, as efficiently as possible, but I don't want us to have a hard timeline that I'd rather, I'm more concerned about the job we do as opposed to when it's finished. And, uh, you know, it may be easier than we think, but I expect uh, we're going to, it's going to be a lot of homework to do before we get to that point. And if you want to do outreach, then it takes, there's a period of time to, it takes to do that. If you want to engage the neighborhood associations, it takes a period of time to get information to, for, to them and receive it and evaluate it coming back. And, uh, you know, depending upon the, the, me the methodology adopted, uh, you know, we want to make sure we've got time to do it right. Those are excellent points. And Robert, I, I, sorry. Go ahead, sorry. 
I was going to ask, do you think it would be appropriate then that we do not set a deadline at this point then and have that be part of the first task of the subcommittee um, once there's a chance to dig into the workload and set out the plan itself? Or would you be more comfortable, would you feel more comfortable having that point set? Um, I don't know. Um, maybe we could have a target deadline. Uh, uh, our, our first full report on our progress to, to, to SPRAB will be July. Are you July? I think that's a good way to put it. Um, and uh, anybody who has gone to graduate school can relate to this um, thing. And one of the other aspects of our report to council can be this other chapter or this other section called areas needing further research. Um, and that then allows you to say, well, here's some things that were just beyond our scope of time or commitment or just got too complicated that need to be evaluated. And those will be spilled out later. So it allows us some flexibility in hitting the high marks and the big problematic areas prioritized to council and leaving some other things for whatever reasons uh, for future work either by staff or another subcommittee. So we've got that opportunity as well. I think that's a great approach. Any other questions or comments about the process? Okay, well, um, I think the next steps then we can, um, I, we can either do one motion to set up the subcommittee, the uh, members and the chair, or we can do two separate motions. Um, I guess let's just do a rough show of hands first to get a sense. Are, how many people are interested in being on the subcommittee at this time? I will say that I am one of them. Well, we have an even four, so that's, that's nice. <laughs> um, four is the maximum that we can have to not have a quorum. And so I just wanna make sure I didn't miss any hands. Uh, so just to be very clear, I saw Alan, Woody, Keith, and myself. Is that correct? Mickey, I know you had expressed some interest in it. So I wanna make sure that you are. I, I did, but I'm happy to see so many others interested. And um, I think others would probably have more time to put that 130% effort in it than I would. So it's great to see everyone. If you are comfortable with that, and if there is no disagreement amongst the um, amongst SPRAB members to have Woody, Allen, myself, and Keith take on this role, I think we could package this up into a single motion that would create the subcommittee, um, but we do need to decide on who would like to fill that role of chair. And I'm happy to take on that role and serve as chair, but I also wanna open up that opportunity up for others that wanna take on a leadership role since I am chairing these meetings. So Alan, Woody, and Keith, I guess the question would go to you if, if you have that interest. I see Woody shaking his head. <laughs> uh, to be honest with you, Dylan, you're the most diplomatic person we've got. I think, I think the role is made, for, I think you would be the, the prime candidate for that I, and if you have the time to do it. Uh, I think we all, you know, are willing, willing to serve, but we also want it to be efficient. And perhaps you've got good organizing skills and, and uh, uh, with Dr. Chandler, uh, uh, you know, it, this thing should uh, hopefully go smoothly. Well, thank you for that. I'm, I'm happy to serve in that role if, if everyone's comfortable with that. So then what I'm hearing then if, uh, is we need a motion to create the subcommittee and uh, appoint Alan, Keith, Woody, and myself, and I would be serving in the role of chair of the subcommittee. Would someone like to make such a motion? Chair sure. McDowell, if I might offer, I would also um, recommend that the motion not just be something general like um, motion to create a subcommittee, but it yes. needs to, in the yes. motion, the charge of the subcommittee. Thank you. Yes. And I, I did put in the chat here um, the link to the the motion that Councillor Nordyke made um, to that text. So I, that's a great point. I would encourage that we could use some of the language in there, including to develop recommendations for usage and permitting at city parks, for of events at city parks. Uh, Chair Dillon, do you want me to uh, share the screen that has her motion up? Would that be helpful? Um, I, well, I can actually just put it in the chat. I think everyone here can see the chat. I can just put okay. the text of it right there. If I think everyone on our, Board. But thank you so much, Robert, for offering. So that is what Councillor Nordyke shared. Hopefully everyone can see that. So would someone on, um, like to make a motion to that effect? Yes, Mickey. 
I can certainly try, but I don't think I can get all the subcommittee members in it. <laughs> I wanted to say I move that we form the Park Usage and Permitting Subcommittee in response to the motion passed at Monday, May 10th City Council meeting and the subcommittee will submit its first report to SPRAB on July 8th. We can make this two separate motions to keep it simpler. I think that's fair. So do we have a second to that motion? Second. Seconded by Alan. Any further discussion on that motion? Okay, we can do a quick roll call vote just to make sure we are on the record for this one and then we'll go into the appointments for the second motion just to keep it clean. Um, Mickey Varney. Aye. Alan Alexander. Aye. Tony Cato is absent. Woody Dukes. Aye. Dave Frydenmaker. Aye. Rick Hartwig. Aye. Keith Norris. Aye. Paul Rice. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Okay, the subcommittee has been established. Now we need members and a chair. And so we need a motion to appoint Keith, um, Keith, Woody, Allen, and myself to this and for me serving as chair. And I've always heard etiquette is not for chair to make the motions. I'll make that motion. Okay, so we have, a, so you're making a motion to appoint the four of us to it, to the subcommittee that was just created and I will serve as chair. And your chair is. Wonderful, do we have a second for that motion? Second. second. All right, seconded. Do we have any further discussion on that motion? Hearing none, I will do another quick roll call vote. Mickey Varney. Aye. Alan Alexander. Aye. Tony Cato is absent. Woody Dukes. Aye. Dave Frydenmaker. Aye. Rick Hartwig. Aye. Keith Norris. Aye. Paul Rice. Aye. And I vote aye as well. The motion carries. So we have a subcommittee, we have our members, we have a chair, and we have a lot of work to do. So <laughs> thank you so much um, for dedicating the time to this. And I think we can really produce a great report and um, some recommendations to council on this matter. Thank you all very much. So Robert, we can be expecting um, a packet arriving from you via email sometime soon. Yes, an email yeah. with a lot of attachments, yes. Okay, wonderful. And I'm happy, feel free to reach out to me if um, there's anything more that you want in terms of scheduling, but it sounds like a doodle poll might be a good approach. I agree, thank you. Okay. Robert, would you please make sure that I'm included in that packet? Mark, you'll be included in everything I said. Appreciate it, thank you. Absolutely. Mark, is there anything else you would like to share at this point? Just uh, open in case there is. Chair McDowell, I appreciate it. I just wanted to um, introduce myself briefly, if I might. Um, as been mentioned, my name is Mark Weinstein. Um, I've been with the city of Salem. I just uh, celebrated my seventh year as an attorney with the city of Salem. Uh, the first two of which were within the prosecution unit um, in the municipal court. Uh, the last five of which has been a general counsel for various departments. Um, I started my work with the operations division of public works um, in April. We had some uh, change of personnel within our office. That said, I've had some opportunity on various projects and things like that to interact and provide guidance and advice to the Public Works Department. I've also had the opportunity to work with various boards and commissions within the city. Um, I, I think uh, use of our public spaces and our parks is, is exciting stuff. Um, great opportunity where uh, the public is very passionate about it. And I look forward to um, being able to provide you the legal guidance and support that you need on behalf of our legal department. Thank you so much, Mark. Really a pleasure to meet you and I look forward to working with you on behalf of the subcommittee. Um, at this time, is there any other new business that board members would like to raise? Rick. Rick. Uh, yeah, I just have a question about our next meeting and in, in the agenda that uh, was sent out, it says our next meeting is June the 9th, 2020. Uh, I think there's a obviously a problem with that I think um, there may be oops that was an oops okay uh, and i also noticed that that the june the 9th 2021 is a wednesday so um obviously uh, you it know it should be june 10th thursday the second okay. thursday mm -hmm. thank you thank you for raising that very good flag 
And I also want to point out just broadly that, you know, this new business area, there's there's been some great discussions we've had in the past and some topics that have come up, including a now we will hopefully have a conversation with the new police chief. Um, I, if there's other topics that you all would like to raise, this is always the time and we can always add agenda items to future meetings based on things that come up here. So hearing nothing right now, I think we can move to adjourn and we will all meet again on June 10th, 2021. So add that, make sure that's correct in your calendars. But thank you all for a great meeting and I hope you all have a wonderful night and weekend.